Thank you. It's wonderful to be on this wonderful to be on this stage named after two great women, Marianne Mir Mirzahani and uh, Marie Curie. Uh, two firsts, so I'll try to follow. So, how many elephants are there in the world? Uh, how far do the whale pods go? How fast does the population of bobcats decline and how many are there in the wild in the US, for example? Uh, oh well, no, it went on automatic. Uh, how many juvenile turtles survive to adulthood? These questions are so important that eight million dollar census, uh, elephant census, was done uh, by Paul Allen's uh, Philanthropic Foundation and took two years. It's not scalable, and it wasn't accurate. We could, took, we could put uh, GPS colors or radio colors on the animals. That's an unscalable effort to put a color on each animal and it may be dangerous to an animal. So what do we do? There are not enough scientists to follow all the animals everywhere all the time and not enough GPS colors. But today images are the most abundant, readily available source of information about anything from our food to wildlife. These images are taken by scientists, field assistants, camera traps, uh, drones, as well as tourists taking pictures and well watching safaris and uh, other tours and posting them on social media. So how can we take those pictures and turn them into information about wildlife? I'll give you a moment. <laughs> So $5 million, no. <laughs> but a couple of research grants later, machine learning to the rescue. Can you find all the pictures of elephants in, those, uh, in that mess? No? So machine learning can. Uh, we, not only we can take that mess and find all the pictures of uh, animals in that and find where the animals are in those pictures, we can also identify individuals, but we can take, so the problem is not a problem of image search that you have when you're uh, going on uh, any one of the search engines and type zebra in it. The problem is that we have pictures in the wild that are taken by amateur photographers. Uh, the, the pictures are overlapping. I don't know if you can count how many pictures there are, how many zebras there are in that uh, top left image. I can tell you the answer is four. Go find them. <laughs> so uh, it's not a trivial problem. There is a viewpoint pose difference. And if you think that zebras only turn front, left, back, and uh, right, you are mistaken. They also show bellies and, uh, and tops if you're flying from a drone. So you need to estimate that pose as well. Uh, there's quality issues. Uh, from very blurry and in the back to obscured by branches and, uh, and vegetation. And finally, animals shockingly age and get pregnant and scar. And, uh, and so we have to be able to recognize repeatedly animals in all of those. So we use, we uh, developed, it's, uh, one of the beauties and wonders of this project is that there is research that's done at a university that uh, somebody's PhD directly translated into a deployed product that, that conservation organizations actually use. So in this case, um, this is a pipeline of five different machine learning uh, models. Uh, most of them are, well, a, half of them are a combination of DCNNs, deep convolutional neural networks, but there is a, a, a combination which goes, starts with an image and then uh, we identify the, the, the presence of the species in that image. We find where the animals are. So we find the annotation the box. We find the annotation of interest. So annotation of interest is a unique thing. Is we, the goal not to find all the animals in the picture. The goal is to find which ones we actually can identify as individuals. And so from that, we then seg that's the annotation of interest. We segment and uh, do segmentation and uh, then we take that 
the annotation of interest and ask from a database of thousands or hundreds of thousands in some cases, who is it? This particular zebra. And the answer in this case is zip the zebra, obviously, right? Because you could find it. So that part is not deep learning. It's not even supervised learning. It's unsupervised algorithm built on a 1990s idea from linear algebra. And I'm happy to talk much more about it. But we also have a clever data structure, and I uh, really like Levi's idea, uh, no, mention of uh, the, the, the answer of for sure same, for, su for sure we know the answer yes, we know the answer is no, and we don't know. And so we ha have a data structure underneath this that maintains the information where we train a model, say these two annotations are for sure the same zebra, these two are for sure not the same zebra, but we don't, for these, we don't know. And the goal is, well, we don't know, maybe because the models are not good enough, or maybe because the left and the right side uh, we can, are different of animals, so we cannot tell. And maintaining that data structure actually helps us not to get the perfect answer every time, but to reduce the number of, of pictures that a human has to verify, and that's the goal. We want to go from hundreds of thousands of images to very few that a human has to look at, and we need to know which ones those are. So after we do all of that, um, well, I don't know what. So this is what a match. So the, the, the algorithm shows a human of whether these two zebras are the same. So in this case, it's easy. This is probably a picture will never show human, those two. Uh, and now I'm gonna train you how to identify whether two zebras are the same, how to recognize individual zebras. So you can see that the top ones have this very distinct pattern, the top two, even though the, the right one is pregnant, you can still recognize that it's the same one. And the algorithm uh, identifies, er uh, uh, identifies areas of the regions of the region of the picture with a high variation of pixel values. And so that's what the yellow regions are highlighted. That's the high variation of pixel values. And the bottom one, we use KNN, the uh, K-nearest neighbors algorithm to match those hotspots, the signature that we compute on each image and to say the, these are the correspondence between those uh, regions. And so that makes it really easy and provides evidence for why the algorithm decided this is the same animal. Even when the viewpoints are different, right, so again, we can see uh, here is what the algorithm highlights as the similarity and the matches. And even though it's not as much of a match as the previous one, we still can identify them as the same. Okay. Okay. So with that, uh, we can do this for anything striped, spotted, wrinkled, notched. We can even use a different algorithm to identify the similarity of the curve shape of a whale's fluke of a dorsal fin of a dolphin on the uh, on the left there. And with information on when and where the image was taken, you can really now use pictures to track, count, um, and, and do science and conservation from pictures and even to do social, social network analysis. So uh, one of the biggest differences I found between uh, zebras and humans, uh, even though we, we can do algorithms at the very high level of abstraction and uh, understand the, the, the social interactions, is that shockingly, zebras did not have Facebook until we built this for them. And so with that, we can really see who, which zebra is which, uh, whose friend, and including for whales. So this is Fluke Book, a wild book for five species of whales and two species of uh, dolphins. As you can see, you, you, there is a name, some basic information, a set of pictures. Uh, when there is a social network, you, can, you get that, and all the sightings of that individual, as well as a map. Um, with that, that's the foundation for population counts, birth death dynamics, species range, and social interactions, and much, much, much more. So today we also have an intelligent agent we've built that scrapes YouTube videos, so we don't, we go beyond images. Um, we find uh, videos uh, that people publicly post, uh, find the, f uh, in this case of whale shark, find where the whale sharks are in those pictures, identify which one it is, 
and then post back in the comments saying, here is, you can learn more about it. One of my favorite, people engage. People engage at very high rate. More than half of, the of our posts have responses. This is one of my favorite. Wow, you're an AI agent from all of humanity. Please don't conquer us. <laughs> so when we don't, we, fig we, we try to figure out also when and where the image was taken using natural language processing. Um, and when we can't, we post back asking, hey, where did you see this whale shark? Or when did you see this whale shark? And so then it automatically is added to Wildbook. Um, people can go and uh, see it. People can nickname it because P323 is not a great name for a whale shark, I think. So for a couple of dollars a month, you can actually adopt, uh, nickname it. For a few more, you can adopt it. Um, you can also see that other, which other scientists and research groups uh, study that whale shark. And in fact, uh, we now have, as of three days ago, uh, more than 9,000, 9,500 well in known individuals in Wild Book with 51, almost 52 sightings uh, total contributed by more than 6,000 volunteers and 174 research group and conservation uh, projects. Not one research group, not one conservation project has the information about the even one individual because these are global species, they travel. Um, and today the intelligent agent that looks at YouTube videos has for the first time two weeks ago overtaken the human contributors. So that's a point where AI is contributing more to save this species than the humans, yes. I think it deserves applause, right? <laughs> um, this data has become the foundation for the official authoritative data for the population size estimates from the International Unit of Conservation of Nature Red List. That's the organization in the world that determines conservation status of the species. When we say a species are endangered, it's because they said that. When it's on the red, we we'll say it's on the red list, that's the red list. So for whale sharks now, that's the definitive population size. That data became the foundation of the most comprehensive study in the, on the biology of the species. Uh, published last December, co-authored by 36 authors who met through the pages of Wild Book because they, were, they had the puzzle pieces for the, same species, for the same individual quite often. So that is how we do, can do science now with that data crowdsourced and contributed by the entire world. The first deployment of Wild Book was at the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy in Kenya for the gravy zebras. And um, uh, with the information that we got there from the, it's also the headquarters of the Gravy Zebra Conservation Trust, we, they found that the number of babies, baby zebras born, do not survive to, the, the, do not survive to, to adulthood is too high. So the ratio of adults to babies is too, too, too high. And the main culprit, turns out, are lions. They're doing such a great job with lion conservation that uh, there are too many of them for the number of zebras that are there. So with the data that they had from Wild Book, they could start a population management problem, uh, program, not problem, program for lions, for lion population, to put the predator and the prey in, back in balance. And the numbers are showing that it's working. Uh, to know how many ze gravy zebras there are in the world, 98% of them are in Kenya. And so in 2016, for the first time ever in history, a complete census of, the, of an endangered species was done using just pictures from people driving around the country for two days. From school kids and uh, local tribal chiefs and rangers up in the north to US ambassador to Kenyan tourists with telephoto cameras, uh, hundreds of people at 45 locations all over the country took 40,000 plus images and we identified every single one of them providing the most accurate estimate of the population to date excluding one area in the north was 2,352 animals. It was so good that Kenya Wildlife Service asked us to do it again and this January we did. Now with more than a thousand people participating with, and more than 70,000 images we repeated, and the uh, total population size is at 2,700 about. Uh, that in now includes all the areas where they are. So that means that the population is actually stable, despite that the fact the numbers are uh, different, because they include different ge uh, geographic areas. So that was the now the basis for the Kenya Gravy Zebra Management Population uh, Species Management Plan. 
And again, IUCN Red List uses the, these population numbers as the official numbers uh, for the species. Uh, we also have one, uh, uh, this time also reticulated giraffe were included in the count for the first time. We don't know the numbers yet. We have the first estimates. Uh, and this is an emoji giraffe. No Photoshop. Though that heart and the smiley face are real. All right, do you guys see it? Okay. So, uh, can we count using photos? We did, uh, so we, we estimated the bias from spatial statistics. Uh, and showed that, yes, these are very accurate numbers, and in fact, the numbers are showing that we, the sightings of new animals by mid-morning of a second day, uh, we essentially did not see any new animals, which means we are covering the region and we're covering the population. We now have more than 20 species uh, for which we have wild books, ranging from whale sharks and manta rays to giraffes and lynx. Um, we have uh, contracts with WWF for lynx, uh, seals in Finland, and my favorite, Internet of Turtles, the real IoT. With that, we really can do, machine learning does, le uh, does scale conservation and science. So machine learning and data science allow us to go from science, uh, from, uh, from pixels, and individual cameras to science, conservation, and public engagement at the large scale and high resolution over space, time, and individuals. And it's a partnership that includes many people all over the world, from the founders and uh, engineers of Wildbook and the top, to volunteers who contribute photographs, who tag the images to train the machine learning models, to the scientists who use the data to conservation managers who uh, put the policy in action and all the support organizations that support our effort, including our partnership with uh, uh, Microsoft AI for Earth, we're a flagship partner in biodiversity, and certainly our partnership with H2O.AI, who are supporting our effort for our next species to learn how to recognize individual elephants so we can do the scalable census of this very fast declining species. Thank you. So we do have time for questions, I believe. <laughs> yeah. So if you saw the, um, uh, uh, the, the Living Planet report, which is yearly report of the uh, state of the species all over the world, came out and uh, uh, it shows that we, are, we have lost 60% uh, of the wildlife of animal populations since 1970. Um, and so what can we do as individuals and as a society? Certainly, at a global scale, we need, to, we, we need to enact the policies that we already know will help so, save the biodiversity of the planet from the habitat to, uh, fr from the habitat preservation and uh, CO2 emissions and all the climate policies that were agreed upon. But at a very small scale that we are working at, with the very least, have to have the numbers, right? We can only have this conversation because the Living Planet Report has come out with the numbers that 60% of the world populations have declined. In order to have those numbers, we need to do all the effort that we do. When you look at IUCN Red List, uh, the data that they have for most species, they have about 70,000 species, um, information for about 70,000 species, we actually, for majority, 99% of them, we do not have accurate numbers. So we cannot have this conversation. We don't know whether the populations are declining or growing. We don't know how our policies are affecting it. So to know that, we need data. That's, we, our effort is, focusing, is focused on ensuring that we have accurate data for these conversations to see whether our policy, policies are actually working 
and what policies should we enact? Um, are you concerned that wildbook data might get into the wrong hands and facilitate poaching? Absolutely. If you were here yesterday, uh, you heard a little bit of this discussion. So uh, data which are gold for scientists and conservation managers, of course, is also very useful for poachers and wildlife criminals. And particularly, uh, not only geotagged image data, which is, of course, very useful for, for poachers, unfortunately, but also uh, the models that we're deriving, because we're deriving actual models of predicting where animals are going to be, right? So that is even more information, which is, again, great for science and conservation. So we're designing, uh, Wild Book is secure by design, so the data itself are protect, uh, the data itself is protected, but we're also working uh, with the world's top security and privacy experts in the world, how to design the right security and privacy policies uh, for, uh, for protecting that data, for enabling the, uh, the, enabling the detection of any threat, and a lot of threat is insider threat for, for this kind of data, so whether it's ranges in the park or people who are using the, the, the data contributors who are using wild books. So um, our, uh, our collaboration was, uh, so the keynote at the latest USENIX, the top security uh, conference in the world, USENIX security, was uh, Ross Anderson, we're collab uh, he and I are collaborating on, we we'll call it Privacy for Tigers. So that's the policy and, uh, privacy and security policy that's going to be enacted for Wild Book. Um, the, how we can, can, my favorite question, how can we contribute to this endeavor? <laughs> so we have uh, several, several ways you, you can contribute, whether, uh, it, first of all, do give us your pictures. Do give us your data, uh, whether it's the, uh, your backyard or the in middle of the Indian Ocean or, or a safari, safari uh, in Africa or rhinos in Indonesia, which is also going to be the species uh, for Wild Book. So your pictures are the foundation of all that data. So please do give us your pictures, upload, go to wildbook.org, find whether we have a Wild Book for that species. And, in, and a year from now, you won't even have to look for a specific species. We will find all, automatically, all the animals in uh, the pictures that you have. We will also uh, take public pictures. We also, uh, you also can, we, we will have on Twitter, follow us on Twitter, we post public uh, calls to actions from different organizations that are starting Wild Book. You can adopt a whale shark right now, just a whale shark, but it will expand to all the other species. You can adopt and nickname it. You can support us directly uh, by contributing to Wildbook, through wildbook.org. You can help us tag and train the models. You can contribute if you're an engineer or data scientist. Um, you can work with us to build the next set of models and the next set of tools for Wildbook. Um, there are many, many ways, and every skill level can contribute. Our youngest photographer so far is three years old. <laughs> so, um, is my time up? Yeah. I think, um, yeah, so just one thing about the sky animal. So for birds, there is a, an effort at the level of species, not individuals, called eBird.org. So eBird, like E and the word bird, that's an effort from Cornell University. Uh, somewhere down the road, we keep on talking, somewhere down the road we'll figure out how to identify some of the species of birds and we'll partner, we're, we will be partnering up with eBird. Uh, how can machine learning practitioner contribute to the effort? Yes, work with us to build the new set of tools and the next set of models for uh, species and individual identification and estimating all the population and species parameters. Thank you very much.